So welcome to the sixth annual Free the Seeds Fair. This is our first time going virtual and we're excited to share our workshop with you today in the comfort of your own home. We also look forward to next year, hopefully when we can be together in person again. So Free the Seeds is a community-based project of farmhands and it's rooted in building a sustainable and resilient future through real seeds, real food and real skills. And while this is a free event, it takes time and money to make it happen. So if you would like to support us with a donation or a contribution, um, we would love to receive it. And you can do that easily by going to freetheseedsmontana.com to donate. So Chris Dye is our presenter today. Hi, everyone. Um, and Chris was born in California and she's lived there for 50 years before moving to Colorado. She began to take an interest in horticulture in her late 30s and fell in love with plants and growing. She had a cut flower business for a few years and she also worked at a native plant nursery. In Colorado, she became interested in permaculture and growing her own food as she realized that our food system was broken and taking care of our own food sources was so important. Today, Chris lives on the east side of Kalispell, and she uses every space in her garden to grow her own food and flowers using organic and regenerative soil building practices. She's going to share her techniques on how to grow in small spaces with you today, um, and I know you're going to enjoy it. So with that, here's Chris. Well, I'm glad to be with everyone today. Um, well, we're going to do the video. First. We're going to so start off with a video. So we'll start with the video and it just shows the garden about a month ago in the snow. OK, here we go. Yeah. And the front yard, which is open to the deer. So I do nothing here, <laughs> except I did plant some um, sage, some salvia officinalis. The deer will not touch that. And they had a fence put in to just enclose this um, the south side of the house. So there's good sun, um, there's good good warmth. There are two pear trees. Um, and then around them, there are lots of perennials planted. Up against the south wall are several pots. Um, this larger one is great for doing cherry tomatoes. And then the smaller pots, I found that um, peppers do really well in the small pots. This is the backyard. And it was when I bought the house seven years ago, all lawn. So every year I try to take out a little bit more lawn um, and put in space for either annuals or um, perennial plants. So there are four apple trees or three apple trees, a peach and a plum. <clears throat> and then this, um, these are five raised beds. Um, and they're very practical for growing all the annual vegetables. So this is, you know, maybe four by eight. You can do four by eight and get a really good harvest of asparagus. And that's not a lot of space to devote if you really love asparagus, <laughs> which I do. See, so along the fence here, some of this is open, which is really good. I've used that in the past for cucumbers or, um, climbing plants. This is a big open area. There's no lawn. Um, and generally what I'll do in here is zinnias and nasturtium, uh, marigolds. They're just beautiful as an edge, bring in pollinators. And then in the center, I've done corn or I've done tomatoes. I've done the winter squash. I've done little bush beans along the edge. So it changes every year. I do something um, a little different. This apple tree is surrounded by quite a bit, actually. There's three honeyberry plants. Um, there's sage, there's um, hyssop, there's some St. John's wort, there's currant, black currant. And then I have a, um, a compost pile um, full of snow at the moment. I don't try to, you know, segregate and then do layers of green and brown. I just pile it on. <clears throat> and that seems to work. So this the spring by april i should be able to take this the material off the top that still is a little rough underneath there's going to be a lot of good compost and worms this is like a dry sunny spot that was a little hard one of the things you have to consider in a garden is how are you going to water how far does the hose stretch 
So the hose I have is way over by the pots and I'd have to bring it down this sidewalk. So I don't often water this, it's on its own. <clears throat> so it's, it's been really good for the time that you can see peeking through the snow. You can harvest thyme all winter, all year, really. Um, and then the sage, the sunflowers I planted once and they have planted themselves ever since. So there are sunflowers all over the garden. These I've just kind of left, even though I'm not really harvesting anything from them, it's just attracting all kinds of life, which is good. And I, this is good sun. So I've planted um, tomatoes, basil, peppers in here before, and then this summer this area was new so i just let it be it was mostly basil um cilantro there were some sunflowers and there were a couple little squash in here and that was a nice combination they worked really well together we've got Harrelson apple tree i think this is my favorite you have to wait a little in the spring to harvest it but it just has a really good flavor and i still have a few in the refrigerator and this area um, is a little hard to water. So I haven't figured in the past, I've grown cabbage in here. It gets pretty good sun. So I've even grown corn in there a few times. But um, my idea is to just let it become perennial plants. Look, this is a um, hazelnut. And I think they, got, they don't produce really heavily every year. You get these nasty years. So the year before, there are actually quite a few. And then this started out as a pretty small plant and it's been in the ground maybe four years. So it has really um, grown pretty remarkably. Two elderberry plants. Started those with just little one gallon starts maybe five years ago and they love it here. I got it from Grower's Greenhouse. It was maybe about a hundred dollars. It has a plastic cover. And so I use it to just harden plants off. I start them in the basement, and then after they're transplanted, I can bring them out here and grow them on until I'm ready to put them in the garden. Um, along the deck is a, a planter that's about 10 feet long and a foot wide. And initially I wanted to grow peas and lettuce because this is shaded in the afternoon, but it gets the good morning sun. And they did really well but there had been mint in the area that I thought I had gotten all the rhizomes out. But after just one year, the mint's growing up through the planter. So now it's just a mint bed. And I like that. So I've got peppermint that I dry for tea. We have other pots that I'll bring out. This has good sun. Um, so I've grown peppers, eggplant, basil, lemongrass in, in pots um, in this area. So there are these four raised beds. Um, these are just cedar fence boards with some four by fours. And you can see it's like lined with palm liner. That way I'm hoping the wood will um, last quite a long time. And then these are pretty high. So what I did is I put a bunch of um, clippings and wood, just debris from the garden and um, then the potting soil on top. So I have peppers in this bed. <clears throat> this is good space for maybe three peppers. And then I had a bunch of basil. The basil loved it in here. It was really protected as the, the best space um, to grow the basil. And the peppers did really well in here too. Then I had a couple cucumber plants and more basil. Um, and then this, there was a, a little cherry tomato and more basil. And this little bed was an experiment. I had um, a little hibiscus in there, but we just don't have the heat. So this is just water. Water is kind of, a, it's a way it'll absorb heat and kind of moderate the temperature in here a little. Get maybe 10 degrees difference at night between inside here and outside. And then yesterday I was in here and it was about 70 because the sun was out, it felt so good. So it isn't really practical to grow in the winter here. I'm just, you take a break and then start over.
this is my basement and I have two grow lights. They're like a foot by about four foot. And I have these boot trays that are perfect um, for just holding um, the different seedling trays. You can water and, you know, it's protecting the tabletop. So I love these little plastic containers. I've gotten these, that you can get them at Hoopers or you can get them at um, Plantland. And I, re I just reuse them every year. I wash them out, rinse them, um, and then reuse them. But I love this for starting the smaller seeds. So this, this size is really good for doing lettuce or broccoli or cabbage um, or onions. You can do a whole bunch of little onion starts. And so this tray, you know, you've got, um, 12 you know different possibilities of things different varieties you could plant and it's in a nice compact space so this is more for you do it an individual seed in each one of these or maybe just a couple small seeds but this dries out more quickly than these larger containers so i think i, I really do prefer this but once again, you have to be really careful with the watering. And I think watering is the most challenging thing with starting um, plants from seed, not too much, not letting them dry out. And then the consistency when you're trying to um, water something like this, the edges usually dry out more quickly. And then you'll have a few cells that are just really wet. I've got this little, um, bin to put soil in and to um you know transplant and do the work and i like this these you can get at home depot and they're really for mixing concrete and they're not very expensive but it's just a a, a really nice um, way to contain the, the potting soil. i have seeds ready um i usually don't sow any seeds until the end of February or the first part of March. So these are all the cool season things. There's spinach, there's some onions, there, um, you know, is, is lettuce. So I'm being really disciplined, not trying to start things too early. <laughs> it makes a difference if you, you wait. And I think that's the big challenge with starting seeds inside is, holding off and then it, giving them a situation where they get enough light so they don't stretch. Okay, um, we're now going to go see, to the slideshow. No, we're not, Let's see, we're, um, here we are, there it is. okay, sharing. All right, everybody, here we go. Here is the slideshow that Chris is going to host. All right, so um, we'll go through these and there's some pictures of the garden in summer with some color. Um, and I, I, do, I do think, you know, don't be intimidated if you don't have a large space. There's so much you can do in small spaces. And I think food is beautiful. Um, I grow mostly food. I do some flowers, but my focus is food. And I think the, the radishes are beautiful. Food is beautiful. Um, and so my backyard is about 50 by 75. And there are lots of different little small spaces within this backyard. This um, seating area where I do have some pots, it's real easy um, to monitor. And then I spend a lot of time out here. I usually in the summer, I'll come and sit and have breakfast and just observe the garden, just look and enjoy. I think that's important. We don't slow down enough and just observe, you know, just watch the birds, listen to the bird song. And then I'll take a walk around the garden um, every morning to just see how things are doing and what might need water. And then here again, there are these pots up against the south wall. So you need to consider the needs of the plants you want to grow. Um, and it is pretty remarkable with this wall in the summer, in the afternoon, you can walk past and you can feel the heat radiating off the wall. 
So it's fun to notice those kind of little microclimates in your garden. And this is just a shot of, you know, the pots in early summer, the first couple of years I did grow tomatoes in the smaller pots too. But once again, the peppers just do so much better. And then this is a really narrow space along the sidewalk. So I think it's, it's a really good use of that space um, to, you know, just have the pots. And then this is, in front of my son's home and he did these are two gallon pots and then there's some five gallon ace buckets and um put he put in deer fencing because the deer are there and grew tomato eggplant and peppers and they all love this situation it was perfect we have the really long days in summer and um it's amazing just the growth you will get, you know, May through through August. So even though this is the west side of the house, it gets a lot of sun in the summer. And then it's just a close up of a pepper plant and the eggplant. And it, um, you can see the little flower, the eggplant flower in the background. I think um, you know, it's just really fun to notice all the different stages um, that the plants go through. And eggplant flowers are beautiful. I think, you know, that's, they're pretty ornamental actually. And then this is a shot of the tomatoes starting to ripen in the five gallon pot. And then this is that the 10 foot by one foot open bottom planter that I put together. And initially I grew peas and strawberries and it was in a situation that got some pretty good afternoon sun and it would heat up the board um, where the strawberry, along where the strawberries were. It just was a little too hot and it dried out pretty quickly. So. I moved it up against the deck and did the peas and lettuces and they loved it. That was really good until the mint came through. And then um, the pot that you see just at the bottom with the grassy plant, that's lemongrass. And the next slide shows how much it grows, um, you know, just in a couple of weeks really. And it's ready to harvest. I usually just um, dry it and then cut it up for tea. And then in the background, you can see the lettuce has started to stretch. So it's gonna go into flower and then it will go to seed. And that, that summer I let it go to seed and I collected the seed. And I'm trying to do more of that every year. Um, just save as much seed from my garden as I can to use the next year. And then this container is really lightweight. It's plastic, about 30 inches by eight by five inches. And I've grown cilantro in it before and you sew it really thickly. And then you can cut it, you know, maybe three times before it stretches into flower and then goes to seed. And you can see over on the right of the container, it's been snipped. So you can get several harvests, you know, out of, a small container like that. And arugula, I've done that where you sew it really thickly and you could, you could put four lettuce plants in there and they'd be happy. So if you had a really small area, you could get three or four of these size planters and you could actually do a lot of your greens. And then this, um, I was so surprised to see how well the eggplant did in a larger pot. Um, and it just was so productive. And then it was really pretty, the purple and the red. <laughs> so <laughs> there are a lot of fun surprises in the garden. I didn't really think about that when I planted it, but really liked it. And then this is a rosemary plant that I brought with me from Colorado. And I, it's outside during the summer, but I bring it in to the back porch in the winter. And that way I have fresh rosemary all year. So if you have a little space, you know, a back porch, 
it's kind of, it's worth it to have a couple things that you can bring in like that. And then I, this is the greenhouse. Last March, I decided I'm gonna invest in a greenhouse, you know, because I really do wanna grow a little bit more. Um, so, and it does make a difference. I can, you know, I will probably put some of the early transplants in to the greenhouse to protect them, the, the tomatoes and peppers before planting them out. And then um, it, if you have hail events, we don't have a lot of hail here, but we have had hail and it can be devastating to um, all the kind of like the basil or the lettuce. So it's kind of nice to have um, a space where you can protect a few things. So the greenhouse is eight by 12, and there are the four beds that you can see the pond liner be. This was before they were filled. And then this just shows before I put up the greenhouse, I had to trim. There's a, a really old lilac bush and there's a, an apricot tree. So I had to do some trimming. Um, and I saved all of the wood from that um, so that I could use that in the bottom of the planters. And then this is a shot of the, um, the five four by eight raised beds that I have. I do a lot of growing in these raised beds. Um, and I, I like them because they are pretty protected. You're not gonna be stepping on anything if you have you know, little kids or a dog or something <laughs> running through. It's a, it's a little safer. They warm up pretty quick in the spring and they don't dry out too quickly. And you can do a combination of um, several different plants or in some beds I'll do just some, just one plant. So um, this just is a, a shot of the bed and it's just being prepared to sow some seed. And there are radishes and carrots were direct seeded in mid-April. They're just starting to emerge. Put a little bit of netting um, above the carrot seedlings. They started coming up and I think the birds, something was getting in and um, taking a few of them out. So decided to try to protect them. And then after the radishes were harvested, transplanted some leeks into their space and the carrots had grown. And um, so both of them just continued to grow through the summer and then harvested both in the fall. Oops. And then this bed um, was kale and lettuce. So the, they were both sown inside in February and then transplanted mid-April. The lettuce will do fairly well into June and then it's just too hot and it'll start to stretch and want to go to flower. So <clears throat> after that's harvested, you could, I could put, I could sow radishes, I could transplant basil, there are several other options to fill that space. And then I've really liked this combination. Um, this is like beets and scallions that are sowed inside and then transplanted into the bed. And then the carrots were directly seeded into the bed. I, I always direct seed the carrots outside. Um, never start those inside. And then the beets, the beet greens are delicious. So as the season goes on, you can harvest the outer leaves of the beets, um, use them in sautés. Um, a lot of times I'll harvest a bunch and chop them up and put them into a freezer bag. And then in the winter, you've got, you know, they're, they're ready for soups or you can add them to rice or any kind of grain dish. And then I usually grow quite a bit of garlic. Um, and the garlic is planted the end of September here and then you overwinter it. Um, this year, what I, I did is I, I sowed beets in between the garlic and in in the spring the garlic is going to emerge you will see it and so when I could see that I sowed the beets in between and then the garlic is harvested mid-July 
and the beets continued to grow and I harvested them in September. And it was a little, little challenging. You have to be careful when you do the harvest to pull the beets out, but I mean, the, the garlic out, but it's just interesting to try to keep the soil covered and try to use the space as optimally as you can. So this is another garlic um, combination where the spinach and lettuce seedlings were started in mid-August mid and then transplanted in between and recently planted garlic cloves and they all overwintered together. But then in the spring, the, the lettuce and the spinach just took off. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, I'm gonna try that again. It was, it was nice to have that, that early start. And this bed is shaded midday. So the lettuce does really well here. You'll kind of find that, um, you know, the different situations, you'll see what works, what doesn't work um, over time. But the lettuce doesn't want a lot of sun in, you know, midday, late afternoon. It's happier with just that, that nice gentle morning sun. And that's the same bed, and this was another season. I had parsley and chard and scallions. And then um, these are early spring transplants. There's chard in the background. Um, in the foreground, there's Chinese cabbage and tatsoi. They're ready to harvest. And after they're harvested, then I can plant basil in that space, or I could sow radishes. Um, on the same bed, the basil, scallions, and carrots were also good replacements. And this shows the spinach that was started inside under lights in late February, then it was transplanted in mid-April. And then this is what it's like in June. It's just this tremendous surge of growth. It's just almost magical. And it's when the days get longer, the spinach will start to flower. So you can see the spinach on, on the right has started to, to flower. So this should all be harvested or um, you I could just let it go to seed. If you let it go to seed, you're probably not gonna be growing anything else in that bed the rest of the summer. You'll just be dedicating it to growing the seed. And then I've used these beds in the past to grow potatoes. So this is, um, these are planted six inches deep in April or May. And then as they grow, you hill them up several times. You just uh, mound the soil up against the growing stems. Um, and that way the potatoes are gonna form kind of uh, close to where those stems are, but you don't want the potatoes to be um, exposed to light because they will then produce a chemical that isn't, isn't healthy for us. And then these are the potatoes, um, you know, several weeks later. So six or eight plants will fit into one raised bed. And out of that, these are, this is the harvest from two of those plants in September. So in one bed, you can get um, a pretty good harvest of potatoes. And then this is just um, a shot of the little seedlings growing in the basement. And I did just the last couple of days, I sowed the onions and all the greens And then this is the little cold frame outside that has the transplants that are kind of hardening off and getting ready to be put into the garden. And that's, it's three by six feet. And that's a better shot to show you what the plastic cover looks like. And it's actually pretty practical. The um, little plastic will roll down and there's a zipper so you can zip it up. That way it's, um, pretty protected at night. 
And then I built a few um, growing boxes out of one by three and a half cedar boards and quarter inch hardware cloth bottoms. And I really like these, they're a little deeper. So there's more room for the roots to grow. And then I usually crumble up just some dried leaves um, or you can put newspaper down before you fill these with potting soil. That way, none of the soil is going to leak through. And there was an organic grower that I knew, I, <clears throat> I lived in California, that put oak leaves in the bottom of all of his um, seedling trays. And it's just, it's interesting, the roots go right for those leaves. And he was explaining that they're going, they're getting calcium from the leaves. So I've always liked that as a, um, just a, a, a growing habit, I guess. And then these plants, um, they, I took them out of the little cold frame and they were just on the deck for a couple days to just harden them off a little bit more. And then the tomatoes, peppers, I sow the end of March. The corn, the cucumber, squash, beginning in May. And then all of these can be more safely transplanted into the garden in June. And so the raised beds, they actually offer really good protection for your young transplants and um, they can be easily covered if need be. I think it's easy to, to monitor them, to just notice and then water. And then I use different grades of remade fabric to protect the plants. Um, in, in the spring, we can have these times where you're gonna get a frost or it's gonna even go into the mid twenties. And a lot of the early season greens can handle a frost, but when they're really little, it's better to make sure you, you do a little protection and the remay is enough that it, it really makes a difference. And then this is a space, um, it's 10 by five. And I like this combination. It has the strawberries, the tomato, the carrot, the basil. They all grew really well together. Um, and it was close to the patio, it was pretty. Um, so I, I keep trying you know, different, different combinations. Today, it's just a strawberry bed, but um, this worked really well too. And this is what it's today, is just strawberries. And actually this is practical. It's a little um, more narrow. It's just three feet by about eight. Um, so it's, it's, you get a lot of strawberries in that space and it's actually easy to, to harvest and maintain. So this is the sunny, dry, rocky bed that had the thyme um, and it has the sage. And this is just, you know, they're really worthy plants to grow. The sage has so many good medicinal and culinary properties as well as the thyme. And then I've got, several natives clustered around. I think our native plants are really important. And I, I have native shrubs. The natives have evolved here and the life has evolved with the natives, all the insects, the birds. Um, so there's pussy toes, there's some artemisia, there's a monardella. Um, And then this is um, one of the apple trees that we saw in the snow. The honeyberry plants are in the background. There's the hyssop and the St. John's wort. And then um, just the tulips under an apricot tree. I think it's so worthwhile planting a few tulips. I mean, this is April. They're probably one of the first things that are gonna flower. And it is, it's just, it's so hopeful. They're so beautiful. They don't take up that much space. And every year I think, oh, I need to plant more tulips. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so then this is Echinacea under a Sochi plum. And this is a medicinal plant, but it's also 
I think it's fascinating. The geometry of that center of the flower is really pretty and it attracts all kinds of bumblebees and different pollinators. And then this is the border with the zinnias and the calendula and nasturtiums. Um, and the calendula, once you plant calendula, you probably don't need to ever sow it again because it's going to drop enough seeds that they come up on their own. Um, the nasturtium, once you've had a really good frost and they've died back, you'll see all these seeds on the ground underneath and usually I'll just collect some of those and then <clears throat> replant them in the spring. I've had a few volunteer nasturtiums, but we found that if you really want them um, to be in a certain place, it's better to just start them from seed again. And the zinnias, I always start from seed each year. But they're, they're so pretty and they go into the fall. So to have that color even in October um, is really nice. And then this is an elderberry in, in bloom. It's planted close to the fence and you can prune it to manage its spread. And the, the flowers can be harvested and dried for tea or to make a syrup and the fruit can be harvested to make jam or a syrup. But I think it is just, it's a really beautiful shrub. The flowers are amazing. And then the other thing is just, it keeps flowering. So you have flowers at the same time you have all the different stages of ripening fruit. So it's kind of a powerful plant too, to be able to do that. And this is a, a new peach tree surrounded by annual flowers. The maroon flowers, that's amaranth, which is also a, you know, an edible seed. So that's the other thing I'm interested in trying to do a little bit more of is how to incorporate some grains into the garden. Um, I had chickens at one point when I lived in Colorado and I grew amaranth and a bunch of different things for the chickens. Um, and I keep thinking, oh, I want to get chickens again. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, maybe. And then even though the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash need space to grow, I think we can fit them into our smaller urban gardens. Just, I think corn is a really beautiful plant. So this is um, the male flower that hasn't opened up yet. It's usually, it's at the top of the plant. And then you can see the little flowers are dangling. Um, so they're gonna be ready to release the pollen. And this is the female flower. Um, and each of these little threads or silks can be pollinated and produce a kernel of corn on the cob. And I think the silks are just really beautiful. It's just it's so interesting to take the time to notice these kinds of things in the garden. And some people recommend you need 50 plants, you know, to really get good pollination, but you can also evidently shake, just go and gently shake your corn plants once you see those pollen flowers. Um, and that will do enough to get good pollination on that, that cob. And that's just a shot of the corn, but I do, I plant them pretty closely, a foot apart, one and a half to two feet in rows. And then um, along the sunny edges, you can plant the climbing beans or um, in, in the pumpkin, they can weave their way underneath. And so that's just a curry squash that is weaving its way. Um, and then I've also had squash just um, on the edge of a border. This is like around one of the apple trees and there's some red clover. It's, it's climbing over the clover, which the clover doesn't really mind. <clears throat> and um, squash is just a beautiful, another one of those beautiful plants. It's just so vigorous. Um, I don't have a picture of the squash flowers, but I the squash flowers are amazing. 
And so this is the last slide. Small garden spaces can be productive and beautiful. Have fun creating yours and give it time to evolve. Oh, thank so, you. Uh -huh. So I hope I hope some of this is useful, but I just I feel really blessed to have a garden to be in. Wonderful. That's a good place to be. Um, thank you. Chris, and of course, we have lots of questions that have come okay. in. Okay. Would you, um, do you feel it's important that you keep the slide deck up or could we drop it off and you people can, could you watch can drop. it? Yeah. Okay, so we'll yeah. stop the share. If we need, if, if you need to go back, let me know. And, okay. uh, let me get my stop share. Okay, okay. so I'm gonna go handle the, the questions. Okay. Um, okay, lots of questions. Um, one question we had was, um, uh, I had a question for you around the, the eggplant and you had some other potted plants in that area that was uh, by your patio that was stones. And I was curious about, do the stones help with heat and keeping that area slightly warmer? Oh yeah, think? yeah, they definitely do. Yeah, I started out with four of those pavers and it was just to put the barbecue on <laughs> and then every year, it became a bigger square, but yeah, there's um, definitely a heat sink with that, stone. with any, with the stone, yeah. And the, the pots of tomatoes that you were mentioning by the side of the house, is that, is that the south side of your house? Yes. So yeah. that helps too. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, another question that came in was the um, when you mentioned the boxes that are in your the planter boxes in your greenhouse, mm -hmm. you mentioned a pond liner. Is does yeah. um, are those boxes open to the ground or is the pond liner? They're open to the ground. I think that's really important. If they're open to the ground, all the life in the ground can move back and forth. So you'll get earthworms, you know coming in so yeah i think it's really important to have it open and so the pond liners is for the it's sides only on the sides for the wood yeah so to that question there was a question in here that was when you change your when you change from lawn to beds or places to grow do you just cover the grass with a raised bed or do you dig the grass out so I've done different things. The first two beds that were in more shaded situation, I dug the grass out and that was a lot of work. The soil I have is um, pretty tight. <clears throat> um, so the other three raised beds, I use the method where you get a lot of cardboard and you put the, um, the frame on top of the cardboard and that actually worked. You just have to make sure that, I would say, you know, double up on the cardboard, make sure it's the cardboard. And then people have mentioned that some cardboard coming from China could have some chemical issues. And I'm not aware of that, but there's a way you can determine the origin of cardboard. Oh. I think there's a stamp. On, on the cardboard, but a good source of cardboard are the furniture stores. So Bitney's in Kalispell or um, Wright's, Wright's, yeah, he, cool. in, in Whitefish. And so then I'm, I'm kind of, so, so you when you start by putting the cardboard down and then your frame on top of that, what what's the soil that you put in? Okay, and then the, I did kind of the same um, method and this is based on um, the Austrian Sepp Holzer, who did this, they call it Hugel culture, mm -hmm. where you take chunks of wood and then debris and you put the soil on top of that. And you can, you can either dig a trench and put the wood in the trench, which is kind of similar to a raised bed. Um, and then you just have a smaller volume of soil or compost on top of that, all the rough debris. So I put just a lot of my prunings into the bottom of those beds and then all the rough stuff off the top of the compost that hadn't completely broken down. And then if you have a good, um, you know, six inches of I get compost from the creamery. I think that's a wonderful local resource. You can go out there on Saturdays and for $20, you get a pickup bed full 
of wonderful compost. So I will mix compost and potting soil or um, compost potting soil. And the peat co is another local source. He's big harm, but it's a kind of a, um, it is a, a peat that's local. Mm -hmm. And that works really well, I think, mixed in with, with the compost. So I use those three. I'll buy Happy Frog or um, Ocean Forest. They've got a little bit of extra um, nutrient in them. And they've got perlite I don't necessarily like, but it gives you a little airspace, helps with drainage and air. Um, and so bag, so you get pico, potting soil, cowspell, creamery, compost, and... Um, and then the happy frog. And or, happy, yeah. And happy frog is, is a... And that's bagged. Bagged amendment? It's a potting soil. Okay. I'm just putting all this yeah. into the chat. So that, yeah. look at I'm typing chat, that's not helpful. Okay. Um, okay. Fabulous. And then is there anything different you do for pots that you have for peppers and tomatoes? Or is it the same, you know, I mean, in terms of the soil mix? Oh, yeah. Um, no, I'm, I do this the same. And then anything in a pot as summer goes by, if you know, the roots are going to just fill in that pot. And they're going to use up a lot of the nutrient that was in whatever the mix was you use. So I will use fish emulsion and um, kelp as a liquid um, fertilizer in later in the summer. Okay. And then I, I needed, I, I started some nettle from seed last year and I have one pot that I need to divide and I want to do more with the, the nettle. You can make like a compost tea with nettle. Mm -hmm. Nettle has a, um, a lot of different minerals. It's really good mm -hmm. as a fertilizer as well. Okay. And then, um, so once you have, a, particularly for pots, like pots of tomatoes or whatever, or once you have built your raised bed, you know, and it's set, what types of amendments do you add in subsequent years? Yeah. So all, all I've been doing lately is just a little layer of the compost from the creamery on top. And then in the fall, I will um, put a layer of leaves that I've collected from the neighborhood maple trees. Just, you know, that spends the winter on top of the bed. Um, and then, and, and I, I'll, put the, the, the compost down first and then the leaves on top. So it's, it's a little bit of a double protection. Leaves on top, okay, yeah. excellent. Um, okay, sorry, trying to, press it. here we go. Okay, let's see. Um, there were a couple questions about the cedar boxes that you mentioned, the little flats that you made. Yeah. Uh, one question was, uh, so the, the, the wood is one inch by three and a half inches, is that correct? Yeah. And then how big do you find that you make the dimensions of oh, the box? Oh, you know what? I think they're like about 20 inches long and about 11 inches wide. Okay, so they're yeah. pretty small. Yeah. And you like them because they're a little bit deeper? I like them because they're deeper. There's more room for the roots. And then um, I had made some boxes that were twice that size and they were too heavy for me. Okay, good point. So, um, and then I like the smaller size because then you have a little more flexibility. Um, you know, I, I mean, if you're gonna plant a huge box with, you know, a hundred, corn seeds, you know, that's one thing, but if you just need 50 or 25 or it just seems yeah. more practical to have a smaller yeah. size. We all, I believe that we tend to forget that that seed is actually going to grow. It'll grow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. I'm going to run through some more of these. Let's see. Um, Jesse Kane asked the question, um, we, when you talked about the lettuce at towards the beginning, yeah of the talk, it's, uh, she asks, um, would the lettuce reseed itself naturally? You know, it, it does. Um, I, the asparagus bed that I have, um, one year I had some leftover lettuce, so I just popped it in between the asparagus plants and then just let it go. 
and the next year they were back mm -hmm. so yeah and uh these are open pollinated or heirloom seeds versus hybrid seeds yeah i don't i try to be really careful i don't so hybrid seeds because okay. I do want to be able to save your seeds. Excellent. Great. Um, and then Tammy Mickelson asks, where did you get your greenhouse? Okay. Um, let's see. That's I, I think the greenhouse mega store is where I got it. And the variety, the, the brand is Paul Ram, P-A-L-R-A-M. And it was, it was like a little under 3000 for the greenhouse. And then it took oh, maybe two and a half days to put it together. There are lots of different pieces, but the website um, describes the process and it gives you an idea. I, I got some help doing that. I was kind of like the second pair of hands and then I organized all the little pieces um, for the process, but um, if you're really good with putting things together and mechanical, you could easily do it. I wouldn't feel I, I needed the help. Sure, putting yeah. it together. I remember I watched yeah. you. I mean, I watched that <laughs> yeah. process and yeah. having it level and yeah, um, square was key. Yeah, yeah, and another pair of hands was helpful you, a couple yeah. times. Yeah. What about uh, the little that very effective uh, uh, coal frame that you have? Yeah, and that again, that was about a hundred dollars. And um, greenhousegrowers.com, I think, is is where I got that. And it it is really practical, you know. And I've had it four years. The plastic is holding up, you mm -hmm. know. I'm I'm not sure you know if it's going to have another four years but i think it was it was a fine investment yeah. yep yeah i i've i've watched you use it every year yeah. <laughs> it's, it's quite impressive um okay let's see and uh, valerie dixtra asks where did you where is your asparagus in the garden okay so that was a little hard to to see the asparagus um the the first two beds that are in the more shaded situation with the lettuce and the tat soy it's just right next to those two raised beds and it is a space that's about the same it's like eight feet by four feet mm, okay and it's interesting I, I planted the asparagus it's probably been in the ground six years now and last year it was so productive it's, it's really productive and the only thing that happens, the space it's in, um, you know, you can you harvest until June, into June, mid June, something, and then you just let the plant go, and it, you know, gets to be four feet tall, and there are all these ferny um, stems and and fronds, it takes up a lot of space, and so I'm always struggling with pruning it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it's the asparagus would probably be better, you know, off in a corner, um, not so close to the other beds. Yep. But good enough. Yeah. Um, and then Jesse Kane asks, I have a bag of potatoes that's sprouting. Can I just plant them in the garden? And if so, how early do you plant potatoes? Yeah, you can, you can plant them. Um, the problem you're going to run into is you don't want them to emerge too soon because then they're going to be susceptible to frost if we have frost. So I've planted them in March and I think that's too early. I, I would hold off until maybe the end of April or May. And then if you did want to plant them earlier, I, I think what you could do is maybe just plant them deeper instead of going six inches go a foot then it's going to take them a little longer to find their way to the surface and the other thing i probably you want to make sure is that they're an heirloom variety versus because isn't they genetically modified potatoes oh that's true i think potatoes you do have to be really careful um so i purchased potato starts from 
both Hoopers and Plant Land, they'll bring them in and they will have organic selections. I always choose the organically grown mm -hmm. selections to start with. So last year I did just plant the potatoes I had grown and saved. Mm -hmm. But, um, and this year I ate most of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have um, as many to plant. So I will be purchasing new potato stars. Yeah. So if yeah. you're buying, if you if you are planting from bagged potatoes that you purchase in a store, you just want to make sure that the variety is an open pollinated yeah, variety. And I, I would say if you are planting for something you purchased in a store, only plant something if it was organically grown. Because then you'll Because then you'll know that it's safe. Yeah, because organic, if it's certified organic, it, it can't, can't be, GMO. be GMO. There you go. Yeah. Um, okay, there you go. Let's see. Awesome. So Noelle Baldwin asks, um, I just bought a house downtown and I don't know where to start. <laughs> we close uh -huh. next week. Are okay. there master gardeners or such that could come help me start to plan? Oh, wow. Um, I'm not sure if there's a, I'm sure there, there might be a master. Garden. Yeah, there is, there is, there is yeah. a master's garden. Uh, in fact, uh, there's another woman here, Christian, um, Georgia Christians, Christensen, who is, uh, is a master gardener. So you can become a master gardener. There's an extension agency um, uh, in Creston and Kalispell, uh, and you can reach out to them. I think just type in master gardener uh, Kalispell and you'll find a website to, and contact them if you want to get um, connected with master gardeners in the area. Um, I there are, yeah, there's also some other resources of, of folks in the Valley who do garden planning and can help you mm -hmm. with that. I'd be happy to share some of those names um, through the uh, Free the Seeds email list if you want to reach out to Free the Seeds. Yeah. Yeah. And then also, uh, yeah. And then there are a number of courses and classes on seed growing and and seed starting that are mm -hmm. going to happen later this spring, some of them through Free the Seeds. So you can connect with uh, Free the Seeds to find out more information about that. That might be helpful as well. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I was, yeah, that's, can't think of anything okay. else. <laughs> well, so yeah. maybe an extension of that is uh, Kelly Subain asks, uh, what would you first start out with? Um, I would do simple things and things that you really would enjoy eating. So I love salads and lettuces and it's like, I would start, if you'd like that, start with that. Um, tomatoes, most of us love tomatoes and the peppers and they're really worth growing. There's nothing like a homegrown tomato. And then, um, oh gosh, the, ch the chard, if you only had to choose, I wouldn't do, you know, if you had to charge, choose between spinach and kale and, and chard, I would probably go with the chard. I, I like that and it, and it grows all season. So it has a really long season. The spinach is delicious and it's really tender, but it's going to be finished once the days get longer. Um, the kale is so incredibly productive and it goes, you know, way into the cold weather. So if you like kale, that's really mm -hmm. easy. Um, kale, chard, lettuce, the herbs, um, just grow the, the basil. I love making pesto um, and fresh basil with your tomatoes. Just, you know, a few herbs. I love the cilantro. And Chris, if you were starting out, um, just along these lines, if you were starting out, would you recommend somebody maybe buy their their basil stars or their tomato stars? Exactly. Um, Farmer's Market is great. And then Terrapine Farms, you can go, they have a little farm stand. Um, so between the Farmer's Market and um, some of the small growers and then the, the nurseries, you can pick up a lot of start so if you're just starting out even your tomatoes go get your tomatoes and peppers from 
the farmer's market or the nurseries. There you go. And okay. the basil, yeah. Okay, great. And so um, somebody, uh, Kat Roche asks, where did you get your fruit trees? Um, those I got at Hooper's. So they were okay. local. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. And, um, and then uh, um, Patty Armbruster asks, uh, do you, at the end of a season, do you keep, what do you do with the, your, like, so you, you showed us the pots where you grew your tomatoes and your peppers. At the yeah. end of the season, do you, do you replenish, do you empty the pots of their soil? Yeah. Do you keep the soil in there? Like, what do you yeah, do? Yeah, what I do, okay, years? so what I do in the fall, once the, the tomatoes and peppers are finished, I take that soil out and I just spread it in a little corner of the garden, and then I <clears throat> gather leaves in the fall and stuff them into the bottom of the pot <laughs> and they kind of just hang out in that pot but in the spring you lift it up and there are earthworms you know at the bottom of the pot with the, those leaves and I'll just like crumble the leaves up and then it's a you know fresh potting soil mixed with compost for the next season that goes into it but take all the soil out I was initially just you know worried about um the pots freezing and losing them that way so i think it's really good to take the soil out if the pots are going to be outside mm -hmm. because otherwise the moisture in the it's soil just going to expand, expand. yeah and, and i think it's good to just re refresh and renew mm -hmm. um and you know who knows it's just carbon's going back you take that old potting soil put it in the garden and i think nature heals it somehow sure, and it's, sure. it can be useful again yeah and you um you didn't mention, I mean, I've watched you do this, but yeah. you didn't mention your own comp using your own compost source, you know, you, because yeah. I've watched you yeah. uh, take your, your compost piles just get totally eaten down. Yeah. And then you put that back into the ground as well. Yeah, I, I do. It's, it's interesting to watch that process. And it's just kind of called a cold process. I just layer things on top. And um, so in the spring, what I'll do is I will just lift all the, the top foot or so is not fully decomposed, but, um, and if, if you saw in the video, all the snow that was heaped on the compost pile, that's insulation. So if you get good snow, you know, it's kind of, part of that pile is going to freeze and nothing's happening, but deep down inside there's still some activity going mm -hmm. and i think even in the winter the pile keeps compressing mm -hmm. it's just um, it's really interesting to watch that process and i do spread the compost in the garden and it is full of seeds so you know i will have volunteer arugula or calendula coming up but those are easy enough to to deal with i don't mm -hmm. mind Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm I'm thinking also because you've got compost piles all over your garden. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking of the one that's in the northeast corner by the um, hazelnut. Yeah. Uh, and I've watched that, you know, break down really fast over the course of a summer. Can you yeah. share a little bit about yeah. what you do that helps it break down so fast? I do nothing. I think it's just the life in the soil is is you water healthy, it? but. Um, I will water it a little, um, I'll, I'll watch so that it doesn't dry out. And, the, and these are, um, oh gosh, what are they? They're maybe about three feet high, a couple feet in diameter, and it's a netting on the outside and it's a, a metal frame, so it's pretty sturdy. So there's good airflow through mm -hmm. the mesh. Um, and it's just a matter of, as I'm weeding, just taking care of the garden and you know putting things on top but it's just the life just takes it down mm -hmm. it's pretty impressive yeah i'm not yeah. really fussing with it much at all okay um folks i think i've answered i've asked let's i don't know if we've answered it but i think we've asked oh nope here comes some more Okay, let's see. Um, 
Patty, Patty offered some more information about okay. the potatoes. She okay. says MSU Potato Lab has lots of information on potatoes and understanding of the diseases that are associated with potatoes. They do suggest that people buy Montana certified seed potatoes so that you don't inadvertently um, pass on or distribute um, any potato diseases. So because we grow so many potatoes and we eat so many potatoes mm -hmm. um, and most of those are, are limited variety. Um, they can be susceptible to disease. So this is a way to prevent um, getting those diseases into our soils, which then could um, be passed on and, and accelerate those diseases. So that's a better, that's another resource for um, um, information about potatoes. And uh, usually if you buy, if you buy potatoes, seed potatoes from any reputable source, those will be Montana certified seed potatoes. So that's another way to go. Um, here's a couple more questions. Thank you, Patty, for that. Uh, Susan Keller asks, how long can you extend the season with your cold frame? Um, the, the cold frame, the, um, well, the, the cold frame I just use to get things started in the spring, the little three by six cold frame. Um, the greenhouse, I'm hoping that, you know, I, and it depends on the season. It depends on if you get, last October, we got a really cold snap. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten what that was, but oh, if you have something and it's dropping down into the teens, um, that the greenhouse, it it's not like it's not insulated around the base really well so if you've had some good sun during the day i can you know maybe get 10 degrees difference between the inside the greenhouse and yeah. outside but if it drops into the teens that's going to be freezing in there yeah so so it's going to what it what it what if tell me where i'm wrong here but my yeah. story is that uh, in the greenhouse, what you've done is you, you're sort of holding the ambient temperature and it, because it's, it's captured, if you will, it's yeah. going to be, it'll keep its warmth a little bit longer than just outside. And yeah. so it, it's a better protection for light frost, but if yeah. you have cold frost, you probably want to cover your plants yeah. as well. Um, the cold frame, tell me if this, if this is, I'm not sure if this is what the question is specifically, mm -hmm. but you know, as I understand it, you're using the cold frame to harden the plants off. Right. Would you, so the types of things that you would, you'd put in there probably first would be your I broccoli do, and things like that? Right. All the cool season veggies can take the lower temperature. So they're going to go in earlier in the season. And then um, I will wait. I won't bring the tomatoes or peppers or anything out if it's going to be in the 30s. And you just yeah. wait. Um, and so tell us a little bit about what it means to harden something off. Okay, so that is just to gently introduce the plant to a new situation. So you're going from inside your house where the temperature is fairly consistent to outside where you're going to have wider swings and it's going to, you know, be quite a bit colder at night. So hardening it off, it just is um, a slower process so the plant can adjust. Okay, great. Um, and Robert Heckman asks, what's your basement temperature? So that stays about 60. I have a thermometer down there and where I have the um, grow lights is right next to the furnace and the water heater. So I think there's a little bit of benefit from that, but I don't have any bottom heat and I've just, you know, used what the temperature that's down there, but it's fairly consistent at 60. And you um, you don't have a trouble with your tomato starts? Um, surprisingly, I don't. Hmm. So if I just wait and, you know, just so I'm a, and then you get some heat from the light. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, those grow lights are putting off heat. Mm -hmm. So, so for whatever it's worth, I use a, a soil, a heat mat mm -hmm. under my potatoes, my tomatoes and peppers yeah. and eggplants because 
I have the story in my head that they want it to be warmer. I don't know, but you yeah, apparently don't. I, yeah, they, they've done okay. And then I'm a little limited with <laughs> electrical situation in my basement. So I have like all these extension cords <laughs> going everywhere and then not another one. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Jesse Kane asks, would you recommend adding some sand for carrots to make them easier to pull or do you just pitchfork near them? You know, I, I didn't know that, oh, I have a heavy soil, but through the years, if you're just adding compost and the leaves, the soil's gonna lighten up. So I've never added sand. I've just kind of worked with um, what's there. And, and I do use, you know, I'll use a, um, a digging fork or uh, I've got a little hori hori knife, the Japanese knife. Those are really good for um, just gently getting some things out of the ground. Yeah, it's I I haven't added the sand. You could you could probably do that, but um, I just I'm trying to work with just the the compost and the the leaves. Great. Yeah. Um, we have about ten to 12 more minutes before we get to, or maybe actually close to 15 minutes if there are more questions. Um, for some of the folks who were asking, you know, how to start, uh, I do wanna invite you to go to our, to the Free the Seeds uh, YouTube channel. I'm wondering if Andrea could type that into the chat box um, if she's listening. Um, because we have a library of, recorded sessions from the previous five years that we've done the seed fairs. And there are a number of other recorded sessions that might address some of the questions that you're asking, particularly as it relates to seed starting. And also Chris, and I think I was either last year or the year before, did a really uh, thorough discussion on how to build raised beds uh, in in, she showed the steps for the conversion mm -hmm. of her garden and um, illustrated a number of the tools that she uses like this hori hori knife and other things like that. So it's a really great um, visual and, and audio description of the, the actual conversion process, which is a, a wonderful way to feel like you have the resources you need to just literally Start. dig in and get yeah. started. Um, so I, I recommend that you go there as well for more information. And um, you can also ask questions uh, if you want to be directed to particular resources. If you go ahead and send uh, an email through the free hands, the free the seeds um, e email communication from our website, we can um, help and we can help direct you to either videos or resources for some of those more particular questions you might have because there are quite a few resources that have been gathered over the years uh, we just want to make sure they're available to you yeah another thing i would suggest um you know if you just want ideas about how to get started is walk your neighborhood um, it's really, if it's a new house and you're new to the neighborhood, it's a good way to get to know your neighbors. And um, I walk a lot, but it's just, it's really fun to see every year there are more gardens. They're going, oh good, those folks just put in some raised beds. It's really fun to see that. And then it's just a great way to get to know people, start talking to them, like, how, did, how did you do this? Or what's working well for you? Um, great a, idea. Yeah. Great idea. Um, are there any other questions that people might have? Okay. Well, um, I, I'm, I don't know that I'll be successful. I, I'm going to let go of trying to give you guys the YouTube channel, but if you go to the <laughs> farm hands nourish, no, no, if you go to the free the seeds, if you go to YouTube and type in Free the Seeds Montana, you should uh, pull up our YouTube channel pretty easily. And if it's a difficulty for you, just let us know and we'll send you the link. Um, I think we answered all the questions. If there are no other questions, we can just, um, I'll just check in with you. Is there anything else you'd like to say in closing, Chris? Oh, I would just say, enjoy your garden. 
get out there and start and don't worry, <laughs> just, um, just start. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sure you'll enjoy being outside. There's something after a long winter, just to go outside and hear the birds sing um, is really refreshing. So yeah, get out and just, I, th I think there's a lot to be said about walking and getting to know your neighbors. So mm. that, and I, one thing I love about Kalispell, people are outside walking. My neighborhood, I see more of it now than ever. Um, and I think especially because of the situation where we've been, you know, forced to not be around each other so much, um, getting outside, you know, in a, in a safe situation like that um, is a real healthy thing for all of us. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, particularly as we head into the springtime. Well, um, I hope you've enjoyed this session. Uh, Chris is an extraordinary wealth of information. As I said, she's got other videos on our library that uh, will just go into more detail. If, you, if you're interested, um, we I highly recommend exploring them. You'll learn a, a tremendous amount from her. We're incredibly grateful for all of the ways she contributes to Free the Seeds. She helps every year. She's been a, a volunteer, I think, since the first year. Um, and significantly, most significantly participating with uh, the organization of our seed packing and seed uh, fair and seed distribution efforts. So she's, she's just a tremendous resource and um, valued, valued contributor to the effort. Oh, I'm glad to be a part of it. It's, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of. Amen. So, yeah. Yeah, good. Well, thanks, everyone. Really yeah, appreciate you, you participating and joining. And I hope this has been helpful for you. We've enjoyed sharing our time with you. And I'm going to go ahead and sign us off. Yeah, happy gardening. Okay, yeah, happy yeah. gardening. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>